the third year and counting, Richard Skipper has been celebrating the artists you love. And what are some of the things that you've really run out of time? And, I, and we've got to talk about your latest. I want to go back a little bit, first of all, and celebrate a true legend. Richard Skipper is all about celebrating life, art, and his guest body of work. And did you pursue performing opportunities while you were in high school? Please join us while he showcases these diverse and talented individuals. Here's Richard Skipper. Happy Wednesday, everyone, and welcome to the latest edition of Richard Skipper Celebrates. Who or what are you celebrating today? It's National Scrabble Day, so we can celebrate that. We can celebrate a beautiful spring day here in New York. We can celebrate Harmony, which is opening tonight on uh, Off-Broadway. We can celebrate Barry Manilow, who doesn't celebrate Barry Manilow. Uh, we can celebrate Tom Dangora, who I'm bringing on right now. He is always worth celebrating. Oh. Well, it's true. And we, you know, the word that I chose today, you know, Tom, we always have a word that mm -hmm. we celebrate every day. And the word I picked today is impact because you make an impact on our community, uh, not only on the cabaret community, but on the Broadway and the off-Broadway community. You make an impact on every person you meet. And I thought that that would be the appropriate word to use today. So everyone who's watching, if you have questions, comments, uh, suggestions about the show, all you need to do is respond with hashtag impact. And you may win this special book today about how you can make your own impact uh, that I will give away at the end of the show. Uh, and I'll show you how that's done a little bit later. Uh, but uh, let me begin with you. Um, who has made the biggest impact on your life uh, besides uh, your significant other uh, and Barry Manilow. Oh, uh, uh, Hillary Clinton, hands down. Easy, easy, easy. Definitely the biggest impact of my whole life. I started uh, with Hillary in 2007 on her first presidential campaign and it changed my whole life and my whole outlook on life and how I approached everything. And I really learned from her um, about putting people first and working, being the hardest keeping your head down and working harder than anyone in the room to get to your goals. And that sometimes you don't have to hit it to win it. Okay. So if you're at zero and you work harder than anyone, you might not hit that goal at hundred percent, but if you hit 50%, you're still 50% off better off than you were before. And I will say this. If Hillary happens to see this show, <laughs> I've only met her once and it was one of the thrills of my life just for the brief moment, because it was a crowd of people, her looking right into my eyes, like I was the only person in the room, uh, meant a lot to me. So Hillary, thank you. And, uh, you know, and uh, that's all, all I'm going to say. Uh, I love her. Uh, and I'm thrilled that you're here. Um, and uh, you're celebrating tonight, you're going to be at Harmony. I am, and I hope my collar cooperates better. No, it, not. It's, it's cooperating, but you have seen Harmony. How many times have you seen it now? Um, well, since the previews uh, tonight will be the fourth. I went last night because I just got back from Vegas. I saw it uh, the two times during the first week of uh, previews before I had to go to Vegas, um, and it's incredible. It's it's magic. What is it about this show that hits strongly with you? Because you also are a a, a co-producer on the show. Yeah. Um, and an you, amazing, insane fanalo, insane. Well, a fanalo. I who isn't a fanalo? I mean, I don't trust anyone who isn't quite. Sure. <laughs> I'll tell you a funny story. Uh, uh, Edna Fanalo, his mom mm -hmm. used to come and see me perform. Uh, many, many years ago. And she used to bring Natalie Schaefer oh, wow. from uh, Gilligan's Island. And they used to come and see me perform all the time. Uh, so I've never had the pleasure of meeting Barry, but Edna Manilow many times in the audience and what a thrill that was for me. Oh, how fabulous. Well, yes. he is, I mean, the rumors are true. He is the nicest man in show business. Um, and we know he is one of the most brilliant songwriters that's ever been he's you know written some of the most beautiful song he writes the songs though he didn't write that song ironically 
and the great Bruce Sussman, who has written lyrics to some of Barry's best songs, including the iconic Copacabana. Um, this has been their, you know, their pride and joy for over 20 years. I know, yeah. Working on this show. And um, it's such an important story. What people, I think a lot of people don't realize it's not a Barry Manilow jukebox musical, though someday hopefully we get that. Um, it's an original musical. It's a huge, huge show, an original score, an original book um, directed by Warren Carlisle. So, I mean, like it's honestly as just big and splashy as can be, but the story is so exquisite. If my elevator pitch for it is it's Jersey Boys meets Cabaret. Act one feels like Jersey Boys. Act two kind of gets into the cabaret world. It's a true story of this incredible uh, group called the Comedian, uh, the Comedian Harmonists in Germany in the early 30s who rose to mega uh, worldwide fame and were brought down and basically erased um, by Hitler. And um, it's, it's, it's an incredible story. It's, it's equal parts inspiring, heartbreaking, hilarious with the biggest production numbers. And this is a show New York has been waiting for for a really, really long time an original show that feels like a classic in the making. Um, and, you know, you just, you get those haunting melodies that only Barry can write, those perfect lyrics that only Bruce can write. And you you watch this and, you know, even if you didn't know it was a Barry Manilow, Bruce Sussman musical, if someone in the know was told afterwards, they'd say, oh, of course, only that dream team could put this together. And so, I mean, it, it, it it's it's amazing. The last 25 minutes of the show, every time I've seen it, um, it's almost as if you're in a movie set because the entire audience cries in unison. Wow. You, you wow. Hear, it's just so powerful. And not to mention, um, it is such a brilliant showpiece for, uh, for Chip Zane. It, uh, he is not, a, the whole cast is not of this earth. A Sierra Boggs is breathtaking and it has always, wow. the six actors who play the comedian harmonists are seamless and perfect with the most, incredible voices the tightest harmonies dance like you've never seen and they're hilarious they have the and they're dramatic it, it's wild just how great it is but chip who i've loved you know we've all loved forever and i was a co-producer on carolina change which he was so brilliant on this fall uh i think it's his i think i i think it's even better than the baker uh it's just such a tour de force and so even even if my beloved barry didn't write it I'd be so in it to win it uh, because of what it's giving us with the legendary chip. It just feels, you know, like he finally got his due. Like this is his role. That's great. Is there a particular song in the show that uh, is your favorite among? Oh yeah. Movies? Oh yeah. 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 Every single day. I mean, that's the big one. It's stunning. It's so romantic. It's so very Um it, it, Yeah. It's, it's a uh, half halfway through act one, you know, things are, things are still looking up. <laughs> Uh, but it's stunning. It's a classic uh, Barry Bruce love song. Oh, I, I cannot so wait. Good. I it's cannot wait to get stunning. there. It's stunning. Um, definitely. But every song is beautiful from the opening number to the final number and everything in between. There's there's just no filler in the show. Everything is a moment. That's it's great. A great um, musical. So I, I start my shows with a random question and I, I, a question that I haven't even looked at. And so the random question for you today is what book have you read recently that you would recommend and why? Oh, want me to show you the cover? It'll take two seconds. It's two seconds. <laughs> sure, great. You can just look, look at Dorian Lord while I leave. Gorgeous painting, yes. It's from the set of One Life to Live. Wow. How about that? So um, we are reading this in my house right now, the amazing Alexandra Billings new book, This Time For Me. It is brilliant, just as she is. She just finished a tour de force performance as Madame Morwell and Wicked. Yes, yes, um, yes. Several of our fundraisers last year. She is the coolest people in the world and one of the most talented people in our industry. And the book is no exception. It's everything you expect if you know who the great Alexandra Billings is. I would recommend everyone read it. Well, you're a producer. I'm going to put you on the spot right now. Why not a documentary on this book? Oh, no. I, you know, don't think I'm not begging her to do anything. <laughs> anything. What does she want? She's yes. A, she's and when it comes out, I want, I want both of you right here on this show. Done. Done. Okay. She is 
I'll watch because just watching her speak is a life experience. She's one of those people who changes the world just by living her brilliant truth every day. That's wonderful. So I want to I want to hear your story because you, you are so amazing. Uh, this past year, uh, last two years, uh, you really went to town, uh, <laughs> saving several of our rooms tonight while you are celebrating uh, Barry Manilow and Harmony. I will be at the West Bank Cafe celebrating Marta Sanders, who got the Lifetime Achievement Award last night. Yes. Uh, Mac Awards. Tonight, she is sold out show uh, at uh, the West Bank Cafe at the Laurie Beachman my Theater. place in the world. Uh, one of my favorite places in the world. I did so many shows there. Uh, and tonight, I will be there cheering her on. You helped save that room. So thank you for that. Um, let's start there. Okay. What is it about that room that you love so much? And that was the first room am I uh, that you, yes. Uh, yes. Uh, that you My started. My husband, Michael, and our dear friend, Tim Guinea. We all uh, jumped so, in. Joe Iconis, the four of us, jumped in yes. together. Where did you get the idea, first of all, to do this? Because with all due respect to the other cabaret institutions, no one was stepping up to the plate. You know, and that was part of it. That was part of it that was actually very, very frustrating just to watch. Um, you know, it's a, I, I've been going there for 20 years, like everyone has. I came here and you go to the West Bank Cafe, pre-theater, post-theater, you're doing shows, that's where you go. And um, what, I, what I think is remarkable about it, it's kind of to me like West Bank and Birdland, those are the places you grow up dreaming about. And, you know, we all have this idea, especially musical theater kids, the New York we're going to walk into. We think we're going to walk into a Judy Garland movie because we mm -hmm. should. And um, you get here and there's a lot of TGI Fridays and dear God, now there's that hateful Chick-fil-A. And like, so, you know, you're like, what, 7-Eleven, what? But there are, you know, there are still those magical places. And for me, that's what West Bank always was. You know, that place where the legendary owner, Steve Olson, greets you at the door. Mm. And you know, whether you're starting out in an off-Broadway off show or a cabaret at Mama's or whatever, or you're, you're Al Pacino rolling in or Sean Penn, he treats you like a star. That's and right. I, Steve treated me like a friend of the establishment from, you know, from 20 years old, walking in for the first time, counting my pennies to get a risotto ball to when I had musical running for 10 years across the street. I had 14 opening night parties there. I had my wedding uh, rehearsal dinner there um, to now where they named a pork shop after me. And, you know, we raised $350,000 and saved the place. It has always been the same real friendship in the real show business, the real New York, just the best people in the world sitting around a table talking about what we love forever. And I mean, that was just something... I wasn't ready to lose. And uh, I was at the chiropractor and my neighbor called me and said, you have to do something. I just heard West Bank's closing in a week. And I said, why? Mm. Okay, 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 I'll go there right now. So me and uh, Michael uh, ran there and said, Steve, what's going on? Is it that bad? And he said, no, it's worse. It's just if we don't, you know, if we can't get some money to pay these bills, there's nothing we can do. It's we've pushed it as far as we can. He said, oh, my God. So we have 11 days to pull this off. Huh. All right, let me think. So we took the dogs for a walk and um, at Target, we were getting, you know, we were getting our our dollar seventy nine salad at Target, because <laughs> so, you know that that's a great thing. And um, Michael said, "Wait, what about an old fashioned telethon? We'll do an all day telethon with hundreds of artists." And I was like, "Oh yeah, well, I mean, we all, we have eleven days. Why not produce a ten hour event in a pandemic when we can't see anyone?" Sure. So um, while this was all happening, uh, Tim Guinea was picking up a to-go order of chicken enchiladas, which if you've ever had them, they're to die for at West Bank. Okay. And he heard it all and he said, I want to help. This is a great idea. And we said, OK, let's do it. And uh, so we just all went through our Rolodex. Um, the first person I contacted was Joe Iconis. And he said, I'm in. Let, you know, let me let's let me jump on the team and I'll, we'll all do it together. OK, perfect. So the four of us just hit our Rolodexes and just, you know, started getting the content, you know, creating big hump numbers. Joe wrote an original song for an opening. Um, we kept saying, Steve, it's your George Bailey moment. You've been helping us for decades. And now it's time for everyone to say, oh, Steve's in trouble. We're going to help him. And so we did a whole spoof. <laughs> we did an It's a Wonderful Life opening where me, Joe, Michael, and Tim were the voices of the angels. And 
we were so lucky we got a snowstorm and we could go film outside of West Bank <laughs> and like really recreate the opening. And then I uh, and then it uh, it closed with our dear friend, the brilliant Andre De Shields, the greatest closing act well, actually the greatest opening act Speaking middle of act. closing acts get uh get to hades town fast because he just i know well, but yeah. you know onward we go yes. and yes i mean and it was just magical and the, the way everyone jumped on and the press the new york times had us on the front page of the art section on christmas eve and we just watched in awe as the numbers went up and our goal was two hundred fifty thousand. we i think we did 360 and we had over 10 hours of content. And I mean, and it was Sean Penn popped in. It was mm -hmm. wild, you know, and Martha Plimpton, Deborah Messing, Andre DeShield, uh, little Ian Armitage, they all uh, became regulars uh, and they all did them over and over again. Isaac Mizrahi, so many of them were just so wonderful. Nathan Lane was the nicest man. I've idolized him my whole life. And um, I saw he had donated on the GoFundMe. And I said, you know, I'm going to be brazen. This is for a good cause. Because you, you don't ask, you don't get. You can message through GoFundMe. And I wrote him a letter just about, uh, like, I was just wondering if you might make a little video testimonial. I understand you're so busy. And on a side note, you know, I hope you realize what you did for, like, loud gay boys like me in the, in the 90s. Because I went from being the boy with a wiggle in his walk to a Nathan Lane type. And that was an amazing, amazing thing to be. And he was so gracious and so kind and immediately responded with, oh, anything you need. And uh, Matthew Broderick was like that. It was unbelievable. The whole community came out. Um, so it really showed me that it just, it took a loud mouth to lead it, you know, because we couldn't financially do it. We had to shut down everything too. We were losing our businesses at the time as well. But, um, it, you know, it just took a catalyst and everyone jumped on. And then uh, we moved right on to Birdland. And then you moved on to Birdland. <laughs> but I want to uh, ask, where did this love of, uh, I mean, obviously you love these venues because you love going there, but where did this love of this business begin for you? Because, I mean, you are practically jumping off the screen. I have the same love for this business. No, I, know. I, I wouldn't do what I do day after day after day. Um, I love the people. I love the business. Uh, even when it gets tough, I, I forged through it, and as as I know you do as well. Yeah. Where did it begin for you? Yeah. Well, it began. I mean, it began as a kid. I mean, I think we all like, you know, get we see the magic and want to be a part of it. And then, you know, I did theater. I I did. I performed as a kid, and um, I thought that's what I wanted to do because it was. I thought it was so magical. Um, and I realized as I got into producing and directing and trying other things, that what I actually loved was the community of it. I loved show people. I loved just being around it. And that's, you know, when I started doing other things, and I think that's just what it is. I think you just fall in love with our people. And um, I like, I think if you can see yourself doing anything else, you should go do it. <laughs> that's what they say. <laughs> because, I mean. So where did you grow up? Uh, Massachusetts, Cape Cod. And I did a lot of summers in Provincetown, did a lot of shows there for many, many, many years, too many years, but it was so fun. I, I kept going back until 2012. Um, I did a, I did a cabaret act first here in New York that ran for years. It did so, so well. And, uh, I wrote it, me and my husband produced it. He directed it. My God. Got a Bistro award. I got a Bistro award. I did. Yes. I, I almost fainted when I got that call. I still have it. I'm looking at it right now. I love it. I love it. Now, what did your Bistro award look like? Because the Bistro awards changed over the years. It's the, it's the glass slab and it still says backstage on it. Yes. I, I have that as well. Yeah. I like what it. Year, what year was it that you got the Bistro award? Oh, three. Okay. Okay. No three. Yeah, I did. A, I used to do a parody of Summer That's Green about gay marriage called Summer That's Pink, and it was a big. It went. It was big. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. then, In those days when you didn't think it could happen. Right. Oh my. No. It was exactly. And I remember one of my first New York memories uh, was the first time I saw Carol Channing. Okay. And um, I had never met you, but I knew who you were because I knew about your show, and you were in the very, very, very front. And within seconds of her entering, and you know, of course, all of us just was this at Feinstein's? Yeah, I believe it was Feinstein's. I believe. Wow. Yes. I don't know. At this, you know, luckily I've got I saw her many, many, many times. But this is the first time, and in the middle, before anything, she sees you and just goes, Oh, Richard. And I just thought, <laughs> could you imagine if, she, if Carol Channing came out and knew your name? I was <laughs> 
watching. No, that's insane. Wow. Um, but yeah, uh, that was a very, those were early squad goals for me. Oh, that was, you know, and it was so funny. The next morning we had breakfast together and she said, uh, Richard, you were the spine of that audience. She said, I need you every performance there. The because but one time I was doing, when I was performing as Carol, I was doing the show and she came to see the show and she's sitting in the audience and she made her, in, you know, she came in after the lights went down and everything. So I'm on stage and I'm telling a story about, uh, you know, about her first time on stage as Carol. And I'm telling the story and, uh, and I, and I, made the mistake. I said, uh, the first time I was on stage, now I'm doing this as Carol, I was standing on the holy ground. And the audience, she goes, it's hallowed ground. <laughs> and of course, the entire audience just goes crazy. And she stands up in, for, and she goes, she's got to get every word right. <laughs> I'll never forget that it was just crazy. Uh, but you, Massachusetts, you, you do you remember the first time that you went to see a show in I Massachusetts? Do. I and do. that you wanted to be a part of that? I do, I do. Um, my dad, when I was in fourth grade, I was really into a chorus line, which perhaps wasn't that appropriate, but whatever. And I have a big old gay dad who was obsessed with a chorus line. And it was very, he was very serious about um, me seeing that being my first show when the tour came through. And it's very serious about it. And I had to see it for Thor Center. His, his child had to see it from the best seats, you know. And uh, it was at the Wang Center. And um, we went and it was, yeah, it was magic. It was magic. I can do that, <laughs> literally. Um, and was that the was that the light bulb moment for you? Yeah, I mean, it always was. It's what I wanted to do. I was I was a really chubby, weird kid, you know. Um, so the, it, didn't, it, it felt always. I always wanted to do it. I was obsessed with soap operas. I loved Bernadette Peters and Liza Minnelli and Ben Vereen and Patti Lapone and you know, still my faves. Um, I'm staunch, you know. Bernadette will always. Now, have be you ever met Liza? I have. Yes. I oh. <laughs> <laughs> I love this picture of the two of you. I had to bring that on. Thank you, Billy Stritch, for that. Yeah. yeah. I so, died. I mean, I froze. Who yeah. was, the, I mean, who was the first, I mean, obviously you've got these icons. I mean, I remember the first time I met Carol and I, what she was doing, she was speaking at a, um, a memorial uh, when Len Fontaine passed away. Hmm. And I was standing in front of the theater it was Carol Channing, Helen Hayes, and Douglas Fairbanks Jr. And Carol tells them that they're going to Sardi's. And I went to Sardi's and got a table next to them. And mm -hmm. years later, I'm having lunch with Carol at Sardi's. And I'm sure you've got those moments as well. Oh, I and was a professional stalker. Yeah, you were? I'm all in, I stalked her into friendship. I've, I, I just, <laughs> oh, I don't, and I don't, I, you know, I just think I'm so honest when I meet them. And I'm so, I mean, if you see it from afar, you, you'd think someone should be coming to cuff me. It's a giant man, like, and I've been really big sometimes going over to these divas, be like, oh my God, you know, <laughs> knock Susanucci over once. Uh, be like, Erica Kane. But who was, the, who was the first, like, major, major star crush that you had? And that when you met that person, that ended up becoming a friendship? Um. Well, I mean, I. As real, I love I love the soaps, and I'm friends with almost all of them now. That I have a one life to live, and all my children tattoo, like that's how into it I am. And um, and um, I loved Patty Lapone. We're not friends, but um, certainly you know can get to her at least. She did the Theater World Awards for us, and I did accost her at the stage door of Noises Off, and had the most fabulous drunken conversation with her when I was 22. <laughs> Good for Where you. I declared that I boycott Weber for not uh, keeping her as Norma Desmond. <laughs> Because what, I mean, how foot and mouth could that be? But she was so magical. Um, I was really, when I moved here, I was I saw Jane Eyre, the musical. Mm -hmm. it, was, it was playing like right when I moved here. And I was obsessed with it. I saw it every day. And I became really good friends with Marla Schaffel, who played Jane Eyre right mm -hmm. away. And um, I also um, discovered Aida then, but it was after Heather Headley left. And Maya Days was Aida. And I saw it 30 times in three months. 
And we became such good friends. She actually got ordained and um, married me and Michael. Wow. Good. She's actually, she's, she's picking me up in a half hour to bring me to Harmony. Great. So when you made uh, the decision, I mean, obviously. You oh, with Ellen that. Green. No, Ellen Green was the first big, big one. Wow. I produced her album at 23 and I was obsessed with her. Little Shop is actually, the movie Little Shop is what made me love musical theater. And I saw her club act and we chatted afterwards and she gave us her number. And then when we started doing well, doing theater marketing, I had some money and I don't know what to do with that at 23. And everyone said, invest it, invest it. And I said, you know, all I want is an Ellen Green album. Let's make that happen. So I called her and said, I want to do an Ellen Green album. Can we do it? And she said, oh, oh okay. <laughs> Well, I mean, many people want to go into this business. Uh, you pursue a career as an entertainer. Uh, let's take this in baby steps. Mm -hmm. uh, you decide to come to New York. Um, when, where and how did that move happen for you? Oh, immediately. I wanted to be here immediately. Um, I did summer stock and, uh, you know, getting like meeting a few people. Um, and then I um, I got sick. I had Crohn's disease. Uh, I have mm -hmm. Crohn's disease. I guess it's not curable, but I'm in, I've been in remission for two decades. Um, but I had I had a really, really rare and bad case of it that almost killed me twice. So I, I spent a lot of time in the hospital, a lot of time in intensive care. Uh, I had a m huge surgery to fix me, and it did. And I was it just put this, it just lit this fire under me. Oh, wow, I just almost died at 20 years old. Like, I got to get out of here. And just go go for it. I have nothing to lose. So I think you know when I, especially the first couple of years after that, my first couple of years in New York, I was just so determined. And I never the thing was I never wanted to be a star. I didn't care about Broadway. I didn't care. I you just wanted to be in the business. I wanted to be with the. I just wanted to be in the community. I just wanted to you know. I just wanted to be around it. I didn't care if it was a cabaret club, a Broadway theater, an off Broadway theater. I love the smell. I love walking in the door. I love walking in the stage door. Walking in a stage door still gives me goosebumps. Mm -hmm. I love I lo whether it's nine lights rigged or 900, it gives me the same feeling. I, I agree. Actually, yeah, I actually love doing the small stuff more because it's the challenge. You get to roll your sleeves up and there isn't a team of a thousand working and they're all, that. those teams are life-saving and magical, but there's something about, you know, sweating. Um, I lo I did the loadout of musical myself on my back, a nine year show. I literally knocked the sets down and carried them to the dumpster. That's awesome. So yeah. were you, but when, what was it about the world of cabaret? Um, and I'm wondering if it's the same reasons that a lot of us decide to do cabaret. Uh, it's a sense of control, obviously. Uh, you uh, create your own message, your own story and everything that you decided that you're going to do your own cabaret show yeah, uh, and get that message out there. And how did you go about creating your first cabaret show? Which theater uh, did you go into? It was Mama. Sydney Meyer started it all. Well, me. that's where it all started for me uh, as well. And uh, our dear friend, Carol Shedlin is watching now, who's about to open. Uh, I don't. Uh, she'll tell us uh, what number it is. She's done so many shows there. Uh, but uh, you... Uh, Get the call from Sherry Eaker. Mm. We, you know, to get that phone that. call that you have been that you've won a Beast Award. Yeah. Where were you when you got the phone call? I was going to see. I was walking to the middle. I'll never forget. It. I was walking to the Middle Lane Theater. It was a show called uh, Cooking. Cooking. Supposed to be Stomp with Food. Cooking. And uh, it was the first preview, and we got invited. And we're walking in. I'm like, oh, I have a voicemail, and I check it. You know, my little my little Sprint flip phone, and Michael thought someone died because I, I clutched my pearls. I was like, oh my God. Oh, oh. <laughs> you know, what, what happened? He's dead. Fell to the street. I won the Bistro Award and it wasn't even for debut. I won musical comedy. So, I mean, in my wildest dreams, I thought maybe I'd win debut. But if I, so, I mean, I couldn't believe it. I won for musical comedy. And you, you did it. And uh, so how did the move happen for you when you, this, uh, was was Ellen Green the first producing job that you did? Yes, yes. That and, you, and the show. Did you know anything about producing or? No, we read a book. We still have it. We thought, oh, we want to produce 
you know, my cabaret act or what, uh, we didn't see it as a cabaret act. We saw it as a show. And I don't, you know, the, uh, everyone does a show. So I, to, in my head, it was ma major to be at Don't Tell Mamas. This is a famous place where the, Nancy Lamont played there. Yes. I had every album in high school. Like I was in, in, in the same building Nancy Lamont was at it. I'm singing on these microphones. You couldn't get bigger than that for me. Mm -hmm. So to me, it wasn't doing a cabaret show. It was doing a show in a major venue where the best have played. That's right. And, like, and nothing. I mean, when KT Sullivan came to see my show, I had the same response as if Queen Elizabeth walked in. Mm -hmm. Michael ran back and went, KT Sullivan is here and her hat is bigger than the room. And I was like, you know, and I still flip out. Oh, KT, I hope you're watching. I still, no, I still, she knows. I still am like, mm -mm, you were one of my first stars, still are. Because she is, she's such she's a coming, star. She's coming here for dinner in a couple of weeks for oh, my she's husband's such birthday. A star. Such a I, star. I just love her so much. Love her. Um, so, yeah, so we did that and we did great. And uh, the critics started coming and saying such nice things about me. Um, especially John Hoagland was magical. And Stu Hamster, may he rest, was the first. Yeah. Yeah. And Stu and Wayman Wong was so supportive and called everyone and said, go see it, go see it, go see it. And um, excuse me for interrupting. That's what they used to do. Yeah, it was so supportive. It was so incredible. And they yeah. said, this is a young kid. Like, this is like, let's let's build him up. And, and then everyone came and um, we started doing we booked it every Sunday for a year and we were sold out for the whole time. Um, then someone found it online and asked if they could bring it to LA. This amazing woman named Cassie, Kathy Malik, who passed away in 08. Mm -hmm. And she brought me out to LA for eight weeks to do it there. And I, I was critics pick there and I was LA Weekly's pick. And, you know, and it was why. And then I had a, my show here was about my obsession with, you know, like Broadway understudies and like how I could treat the understudy in Naida as if it was Meryl Streep, right? To me. Um, do you realize how appropriate that show is right now? Yes, I do. Actually, I do. Um, and then we did an LA that? version that was more mainstream for me. It was still obscure as f. You right? Like instead, this time I was like, oh, we need some. We need some really mainstream stars. And this was two thousand four. Jane Wyman. I'm going to write a bit about how my my childhood obsession with Jane Wyman, and you know, and like, and so it was still ridiculously obscure and you know, a 24 year old acting like a 70 year old gay man. But I think that's why people liked it. And I think it worked because I didn't realize how obscure it was. I played it really seriously. You know, I, I gave it like I gave it the full commitment and it was so ridiculous. And then that got such a response. We decided to go into a come back to New York and do a bigger room. And I did a 16 or 18 weeks. Do you remember when they had the upstairs at Studio 54 where New oh, yes, was? Yes. I closed it. I did the last 16 weeks and it was sold out. And then I moved to Theater Row and actually played the Kirk Theater for 12 weeks where I would end up bringing musical for 10 years. And that's and then I said, OK, well, I think after after two and a half years and playing coast to coast and, you know, going from Don't Tell Mama to 54 to Theater Row, I think I can call it a day. Do you think that you would bring that show back now, especially now because of the understudy? I brought uh, it back uh, for my 30th birthday 13 years ago, and it was so much fun. Um, I would do like, I mean, I know because I really just stopped performing and people. And, and, and so I do hear that a lot. If you do a deep dive into me, you find the perform, you know, the reviews and the articles and people are like, well, I've never just heard of someone giving up, quitting like that. And I said, it's because of the videos now. You're going to find out I'm not as good as they said I was. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's so the funny. legend, the legend lives in uh, A plug right now for everybody. On Tuesday night, Sandy Duncan is interviewing me. And do you know this? No, so Don Korea and uh, he, he reached out to me this morning and I says, my sister is writing something and she's going to send it to you because Sandy wants like an outline. And he said, no, not from your sister. She wants the dirt. And I said, there is no dirt. <laughs> There's nothing there. So this is very funny that they're, and I go, but those videos, they're not there anymore. I took them all off the internet. So, yeah. I, you know. Oh, I mean, I have a Sandy Duncan story. That's fabulous. Well, you want to share it? Yeah. Um, 
So when I was in Naked, when I was in Naked Boy singing before I took it over, now I'm the producer and director of it and have been for many years, but it start I started as a Naked Boy in 01 in the Provincetown production. And um, the late, great, amazing Stephen Bates, who wrote many of the best songs in the show and is the original musical director and was the musical director for the first Provincetown production. Um, I was the baby of the cast, so I lived with him and his uh, partner, who's still my dear friend, uh, Larry Baker. And they were very good friends with Sandy. They even had her Yorkies, Buddy and Betsy. Ah, uh, yes. <laughs> when she moved from LA to New York, they took them. Um, and uh, Sandy was doing um, Crimes of the Heart at uh, Cape Playhouse. And they said, you know, do you want to go on the day off? Do you want to see Sandy Duncan? I was like, oh my God, of course I do. Um, and we'll have lunch with her. What? Okay. So <laughs> we have lunch. And I'm just like, Sandy Duncan, oh my God, you know, and this and this and this. And, you know, like you're the only person that could replace Valerie. Like, I mean, that who can replace Valerie successfully? Only you, Sandy Duncan. And, and, and then I was like, you have to, oh, come see the show. I'm really funny in it. Like, you should come. I want you to, and she was like, I'm just not seeing your show, kid. Stephen's been trying to get me for years. And I was like, no, it's so fun. I'm great. And she's like, I'm sure you're great. Put on a pair of dungarees and I'll watch you. <laughs> Quote. Put on a pair of dungarees and I'll watch you sing. Um, I thought it was the funniest thing anyone ever said to me. I still only refer to jeans as dungarees because of that moment. Well, that's that's so funny. So you were in Provincetown with the whole controversy. I was. I was in the middle of it. Uh, so what was that experience like for you to be in the whole controversy? Because I remember Naked Boy singing and there was going to be pickets and everything. It was. Yeah, it was yes. crazy. Uh, it was I was I was 22 and I had the best uh, three and a half months of my life. And the ticket sales went through the roof. We 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 were doing 12 shows a week, um, and it was just wild. You know, at first we thought, oh God, they're going to shut us down, and we were already having the best time ever. Um, but then when we realized, oh no, it's just making it the biggest thing in the world. And I mean, it was crazy. Like you're doing your little summer naked show, and all of a sudden your show's the cover of the New York Times. We were on we were on CNN. And that's not, and for me, that was crazy. And um, I actually, I auditioned for it in New York. I moved to New York, got the job and was sent back to Cape Cod. And I was like, okay, New York, I get the hint. Um, but it was the best summer of my life. I became friends with Margaret Cho, who I stayed friends with. And I didn't know who she was. It was so embarrassing. I was a Broadway kid. I didn't care about, I didn't even have a TV. I just cared about theater. That's it. I was, that's all I did. I just listened to cast recordings. I was that boy when they would say soundtracked, it was like the biggest insult in the world to me if you didn't say cast recording. Yeah. Like I was that bad, you know, I was one of those. Um, what? And I know what my experience is. Uh, I loved performing in Provincetown. Oh. You, I mean, what, from those who, your experience of performing in Provincetown and especially in a big hit show like Naked Boy Singing. Yeah. Oh, it was magic. I mean, it's a real, it's such an artist community, it's such an art community. It, it really, really is. Um, it, it's it's like nothing else because there's so many shows and everyone's on the street and their little corner of it, you know, barking their shows, passing out postcards, trying to grab the people. It's like nothing else. You work 12 hours a day for mm -hmm. your mm -hmm. show. You work all, you're on the street all day to get any kind of an audience. So when you have a hit, it's so exciting there, you know, and the fact that I did it for t uh, 11 years was wild. I mean... I don't have the stamina now. It was exhausting. But well, it's funny. I my mean, husband he wants to go for a week this summer, and but we're trying to plan our week based on the shows. You know, yeah. we want who's going to be performing this week. Who yeah, are going to yeah. be able to see while we're there? Because yeah, the excitement of going to the shows each night, you know, that's part of the excitement of being there. You go to the beach during the day, and you see the shows during the night. There's nothing like Provincetown. Oh, absolutely. And, uh, I so, mean, it's, yeah. But so you're producing the. Uh, what did you learn about yourself from producing uh, Ellen Green's uh, first album? Or I, guess, I had a lot of patience. Okay. Um, no. Um, when actually, what well, that was because I'm so camp. I'm so wired for camp, mm -hmm. and so much the yuck yuck. You know, I. Like I just, yeah, I mean, I'm all the worst habits in show business. It's just the laugh at all costs and whatnot. And she's such an artist. So being so young, so enamored with her, 
thinking she's this musical comedy goddess, which she is, but the reason she's a genius at musical comedy is because she never plays it for the joke. She plays it for the reality of it. She plays Audrey as Shakespeare. Audrey is high tragedy to her. And that's why it's one of the greatest performances in musical comedy history. And we learned that and we learned arc and we, we learned flow from her. We learned song order from her. Um, Cause we also did her, her one woman show all over the world. We did it in the West end for three weeks in 2005. And then um, our first big show here was called a Broadway diva Christmas in December of 2005 with Ellen Green, Maya Days, Marla Schaffel, Kathy Breyer, and the brilliant Christine Petty, who then I worked with for the next 500 years. Mm. Ever. Um, and even that, you know, is where we learned, okay, there's already a Radio City, there's already all this, let's try to do something sophisticated. We'll have the laughs in there too, but like, let's, let's go to the beauty of it. Like, you know, um, let Ellen Green do Silent Night in the original German. There were grown men crying, you know? Uh, so I think we learned, we really learned a lot about the artistry of it and that you also don't have to sacrifice comedy and that, you know, you can't have great comedy without great drama and you probably can't have great drama without some comedy kind of a thing. Now, you said that you had this book that you learned a lot from. Are there certain people in this business that you consider your mentors or people that you emulate oh, sure, in sure. terms of who you really go this? I was talking to someone the other day who uh, hopefully she's uh, well is either watching or will see it later. And, we, and she, I was talking about her career and I said, well, who has the career that you want? You know, where are they working? Who are the people that they're working with? Because I believe that's very, very important in terms of mapping out a career. And I talk to people who on both sides of the footlights, um, do you have a career plan or do you find that the way that your career is unfolding is based on the context that you're making and the circumstances that are being presented to you? Um, yes, I do. I don't think, um, I don't think you can plan it correctly. You're just gonna make yourself crazy. You know, everything I thought I wanted, I never got, but I never imagined my life would be so wonderful. So there's a lesson there somewhere. You know, um, I always say, you know, I, I kill myself, I shoot for the stars. I've never hit the stars once, but I constantly land on the moon and the moon's a pretty amazing place to hang. Um, so, uh, you know, I heard Kathy Griffin once say, just say yes to everything. Joan Rivers said, just say yes to everything. That's a secret to success. I say yes to everything if I can do it. I never, I never, ever, ever, ever say no. I love working. Um, I like it all. So I try my best. If it's, if I'm not booked, I'll do it. You know, Joan Rivers famously said in that brilliant documentary where she was snubbed of an Oscar nomination, I'm still not over it for her, um, that, you know, she opened an empty page in her, her, her calendar book and said, this is my biggest nightmare. And that's my biggest nightmare. I just want to work all the time. I want to do every, I mean, between, I was fully booked today between 4 p.m. and getting picked up for opening. Of course I want to do an interview. That's what a magical way to go into opening night. That's the best thing you can imagine. Absolutely. And I'm thrilled you said yes to me. But oh, it, it, I, I feel I exactly, no I, you. well, I feel you're exactly, a legend. well, thank you so much. Uh, what did you just say? I said you're a legend. Uh, you're the second person to say that. I've known you. I'm gonna start I've, listening to it. Thank I've you. I've known you since the first day I moved here. I worked for uh, who you want to talk about people who were very influential. I worked for Brad Van Ostrand when I first moved here. He was my first boss. Oh my god! And he, and he brought me to see you. Wow! And we flyered for your show at Don't Tell Mama. Uh, wow! I don't believe yeah. this. Wow! Well, you're taking me back. Well, you know, so what's, I, I mean, I know that Harmony is opening. It's going to be a huge success. I'm knocking on, uh, you know, yes. Well, so it, you know, it, it has nothing to do with me, um, but it deserves to be. Uh, it is It is so important. It is so relevant right now with what's happening in Ukraine. Um, you sit there in horror going, how could this happen? Well, it's happening right now. It's happening as we speak. And the, I mean, and that's a horrible coincidence that we wish wasn't happening, but it makes it so poignant. And, you know, I've seen the show three times and I, I flew home from Vegas uh, two days ago and wa and did that horrible thing we do where I got glued to CNN and MSNBC and watched all the coverage. And it was just, it's so horrifying. 
Um, I know every beat of harmony. I, I've, I sobbed like at a funeral last mm -hmm. night, just watching it, just going like, oh my God, we're like, we're experiencing this again. It's so important, but it's also so important to tell their stories. These were people that you would have known. You would have known them. Mm -hmm. Everyone would have known them. They were erased because half of the group were, were Jewish men. They were wiped out, films destroyed, albums destroyed, you know, and they were becoming the biggest stars in the world. They just played Carnegie Hall, just did the, uh, the, the Follies with Josephine Baker. They had done 12 movies. They were huge. If you go to Germany today, there's still like Beatlemania type, you know, uh, tribute groups and whatnot. Wow. So it's just such an important story to be told. And one of the greatest writers who ever wrote music wrote it. I mean, it's just a win, 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 win. Yeah, it's it, well, we are going to give away a book so that uh, hopefully other people can make the same kinds of impacts that you're making on this business. And I really appreciate it. And so while we're, you know, everyone, uh, please uh, respond with hashtag impact. And uh, it, as my homage to James Lipton, I mention him every show. Uh, what I'm going to do is, um, Tom, I'm going to be asking you some questions. These are some random questions I pulled together specifically for you today. I love it. So the first question is, what's the worst thing that you've ever done in your uh, profession uh, mm -hmm. that you feel that you've done and how did you get through it? Like, wor like meanest or worst quality? Whatever that means for you. Okay. We did a show years ago. Do you remember when Dylan's became an Indian restaurant? I do. We I did do. A show I performed back. at Dylan's. We did a show back there. Oh, didn't you do the Mama Roses there? The War of Mama know. Roses? Yes. Why does up with my memory? See, Richard, I'm good. I'm good. I see. Yeah. I, know you. I know you. I just knocked that out. I did War of the Mama Roses. Yeah, I just knocked that out. Um, how about that? Um, so we did we put a show together called Back in Pictures, which uh it was after the economy crashed and we noticed that TKTS and everything, nobody spoke English for a minute and Mondays were over. So I thought like, well, how can we put something up super quick that you don't need any English? And we put this review together with Lance Horn, who's brilliant, um, mm -hmm. that uh, it was it was the, the songs of the movie musicals of the 20s, 30s and 40s. And it was stunning. It really was. The cast was gorgeous. Um, Tiger Martina choreographed it at the same time he was doing Lies at the Palace. It was beautiful in the rehearsal space. Then we brought it into that room and realized it did not match the room and the samosas being, you know. <laughs> However, it was still one of it was still a Dan Gora show, so it ran eighteen months um, until the government. Actually, we didn't close. The government seized the building. We showed up and there were padlocks on the door. We lost our mics, our costumes, everything. Oh, I remember when that happened. But it oh. never worked. The show never worked, and it was one of those things where I'd have to sit down and uh order like a pitcher of beer with a few shots just to get into it and be like all right forget the environment just focus on these amazing performers these gorgeous lance horn arrangements and whatnot that uh, bob gainer was in it who's done a million broadway shows and i'll never forget uh we were sold out and the stage manager comes up to me and is like bob is in this crazy traffic coming in from jersey you know tom like the under there's no understudy here like you fit the suit the show's in five minutes. I mean, do you really want to refund all these tickets? And I was like, give me another pitcher of beer and three shots of tequila. I'll be ready in five. And I just, I, I winged it. I went on. Good for you. Good and, for I, you. And, I, and I hadn't performed in years. Well, you may have just answered the next question, but maybe not. I don't know. What experience in your career has made you the wisest? Oh my. Um, I don't know. Uh, it's a lot. It's so much. Um, the wisest. Well, I don't know how wise I am yet. Um, I mean, the. I mean, the. I've grown the most doing musical. That was the most amazing experience in my life. It was ten years. And if you don't know what musical is, it's um, it's a musical review that uh, you know spoofs the current uh, current events, and we're always changing it. So it was like being in previews for a decade. Uh, we're in Vegas right now, um, and it's killing. Um, but you not only was that my favorite experience of my life, but it definitely changed everything you don't sweat you're never nervous um you're able to tackle anything you can look like we can sit through any previews of any new shows and within a second just know 500 things need to change and and not be daunted by it because we did it for 10 years you know um and we, we broke a lot of records in the meantime and 
So it, it, yeah, it's it's wild uh, what that show did, but it changed everything. It just changed yeah. the way you you look at everything. That was great. Uh, what scares you the most about this profession? Scares me? Mm -hmm. Oh well, I you know I'm one of those people, especially when it comes to things I believe in. I'll take I will take everything I have except my dogs, and I'll I'll put it all on red and spin the wheel. You know, so um. I'm always very nervous. I'm going to be bankrupt in like three minutes because I, I've never blinked. If I love something, if I if we believe in something, we will drain the bank accounts. I will sell things. I will pawn. It doesn't matter if I want to, if I believe it deserves an audience, we'll go all out and then hold our breath for the next, you know, three to six months to see if the world, if, <laughs> you know, we're going to have a home. But I think that's the scariest, but it's also really exciting. Yeah. Absolutely. 20 years later, I, I still have an apartment. So, you know, we're winning. <laughs> so out of all the shows that you've done, this next question, what is the most outstanding example of wealth that you feel that you've experienced in this business? Do you mean financially? Yes. I'm going to tell you, I made so much money on my, on my act. When I was at 54, I was making three to five grand a night. I couldn't believe it. Um, when I did the celebrity series and musical, we had a we had a, a splurge where we made we box office was insane for a minute. But I think the most lucrative thing I've ever done is is Naked Boy singing in Provincetown when I produced it. And I had a drag show for three years called Icons that I I created with my husband that was all dancing and it recreated the iconic dance performances mm -hmm. of of the icons through the years. You couldn't get a ticket to it. I made so much money on that show, it was insane. Mm -hmm. uh, it was so much fun, but it was such hard work. Uh, you know, we just thought it was going to be an after show for Naked Boys, and I budgeted it so if we could sell 30 tickets a night, we could float it and not have to share the dressing room with anyone. So we did it, and then all of a sudden, we were going to do four shows a week. We ended up doing 12 a week. Wow. Instead of 30 people a night, it was at capacity every night. We had repeat fans. They named themselves. They called themselves the I fans. And um, it just, it made a fortune and it was so much fun. Oh, that's great. In which part of this week did your time go the fastest and the slowest? I think, I mean, obviously the fastest coming from Vegas <laughs> to New York, cause I lost three hours. You get on a plane at noon, you come home at bedtime, um, you know, and uh, I, I would, I, I'll let you know when it goes slow. I, I'm waiting to catch my breath this week. This is a big one. Cause I'm, here for 48 hours, then back to Vegas, you know, and whatnot. But uh, yeah, I don't, I guess it went slow when I was sleeping. I just okay, missed good. Missed it. Um, what, uh, you know, in your career, has there been a, has there ever been a lull for you? And was there a moment where you felt, will I ever work again? Yeah, every day. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I don't believe that for a no, moment. No, no, no. Um, you know, when we did the Christmas show, we did it like two boys who didn't know what they were doing. It was stunning and the reviews were exquisite. And I always say we produced that off-Broadway show the way only new producers could produce it because we spent too much money and it was gorgeous. We even got invited to, we opened the tree lighting uh, at Rockefeller Center. Megan Mullally and Al Roker introduced it, you know? Mm -hmm. But there was no way to make a profit and we lost our shirts. And it was a very scary time afterwards thinking like, well, maybe I'm not cut out to do this. and. It was it was probably a year before we got back on the horse and did anything again. And um, after the the Hillary OA campaign, I wasn't sure what I wanted to do. So I actually got my real estate license and decided maybe I was going to leave the business. And I did real estate for two months. I did well. I was the employee of the month, both two, both months. Good for you. Um, I still have the trophies. But um, then I realized, nope, there's only one thing I do. And I was, uh, they thought I was, as I was at my desk, they thought I was doing a real estate deal. I was booking Naked Boys at the Crown and Anchor for the summer. Good for you. Good for you. Um, what actions did you take this week, uh, well, uh, towards uh, your career? Uh, I think we've, you've answered those questions. I mean, tonight? Yeah, tonight. Know. And then yeah. I, have, I have Naked Boys in a musical this weekend. So um, I'm writing new things. So, you know, always, always moving forward. Uh, and what was the most assertive thing that you feel that you've done today? Oh my God, today, um, well, I, I definitely yelled at my poor husband. 
Aww. about uh, having about the time crunch we were on and helping me get on the stream yard. And he had an appointment and I made him late. So I wasn't late for you. Oh, I'm so, so sorry. So apologies. So it doesn't I have... to begin with ASS because I put it in it. Is okay. Right? <laughs> so I've got one last question and yeah. this is based, I, I have a calendar on my desk and I pull these passages from the calendar and I will read this to you. It says, when I'm tempted to be hard on myself, I ask, what would I tell my best friend if they were in the same situation? So uh, let me be my own best friend today, my own best friend. Uh, what loving guidance would I offer a dear friend if they were dealing with whatever I'm dealing with? Um, with whatever low points you've been or whatever you're going through right now, would you treat your best friend the way that you're treating yourself today? Absolutely not. And all of them keep screaming it at me for the past six weeks. <laughs> wow. Okay. So we're going to give away a book and, you know, and I'd like to thank you of you as a best friend because you are just- We have to go to West Bank with KT. What was that? We have to go to West Bank with KT. Uh, well, she's coming here for dinner uh, uh, for my husband's birthday. Why don't you come? Okay. Fabulous. Okay. Email me. Uh, yeah. Just private message me and I'll give you the information. Okay. So we're going to give away uh, the book. And this is how it's going to work. And uh, and then let's see here. Uh, Gary, thank you so much. So Gary, once again, send me a private message uh, with your email, uh, your mailing address. Make sure I've got it. And I will make sure that you get this book. And uh, we'll see what you're going to be producing next. Uh, don't go anywhere for a moment, Tom. Uh, so I want to thank everybody for being here. Um, I know that I can speak for Tom when I say this. We don't take it lightly when you show up. So thank you for spending the last hour with us. Tom is going to have to rush off to the theater, so I want to be very yeah. quick with this. So everyone, thank you for being here. After today's show, please leave a comment on YouTube. Let us know what you think of today's show. Please share this with your friends. Um, I always end every show by telling everyone to go out and do something nice for somebody else without expecting anything in return. Go to your Facebook friends list and reach out to the fourth name on the list and reach out with a phone call. Let that person know what they mean to you, uh, not with an email message, but a phone call. Uh, as my dear friend Sean Moniker says, we're all in this together, but we're not in the same boat. And I always say, if you're going to go out in a boat, make sure you bring a skipper along. Tom, I'm going to leave the screen. You've okay. got the final word. Final word. Anything you want to say about anything that we talked about today that you want to build upon, anything that we didn't say that you wish we had, or just any final message. Thank you. Will you come back sometime? I'd love to. Okay. And it's all yours. I know you got to go in a few minutes. So uh, it's all yours. Oh, my. Hello. Wow. It's for my first song I'll be doing now. Um, thank you all for having me on. It was a joy. It's always amazing to be with Richard. Thank you for supporting Richard. People like Richard made our industry what it is and gave people like me when we came to New York something fabulous to watch and look up to. Um, I would love it if you'd come support Barry Manilow and Bruce Sussman's brilliant show, Harmony. It's a very special show. It means a lot to a lot of people, including me. If you are in Vegas, please come see Naked Boys singing or Musical the Musical or both. Oh, my God. And um, thank you so much for watching. Thank you all for just supporting all of, all of New York theater right now, Cabaret, Broadway, Off-Broadway, Off-Off-Broadway. We still need you. And as Richard said, Please just keep showing up. That's all we can do. And it's more appreciated than you can ever imagine. Um, I'll end quoting Hillary. Never stop believing that fighting for what's right is worth it. Um, thank you so much for having me. And I'll see you soon. <laughs>